Well, Hiram, man, it is great to have you on the show. I've been looking forward to our conversation for quite some time, and uh, I know it's going to be a good one, man. I'm excited. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Daniel. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Well, I know that you're better at introducing yourself than I am, so I'm just going to go ahead and let you do that. All right. Yeah, my name's Hiram Kemp. I preach for the South Florida Avenue Church of Christ in Lakeland, Florida. I've been here since 20. 20- 2016 my wife Brittany and I have two children Nadia and Andre and um, I teach Old Testament classes at the Florida School of Preaching as well and so that's pretty much the work that I'm doing right now Um, I'm on a podcast with Forrest Antimaceris we both went to preaching school together and we're on a podcast called God Magnified seeing the glory of God in every book of the Bible and on that podcast we just walk through books of the Bible taking text apart exegeting verse by verse through books and we end every episode talking about how God is magnified in the text. And so that's some of what some of what I'm up to right now. Well, man, I think that's fantastic. I love, love the uh, God Magnified podcast. My wife loves it. I listen to it at the gym and we just finished talking about longer episodes, man. I love when the episodes are longer uh, because my, <laughs> my workouts are usually uh, longer. But uh, thank you for clearing up Forrest's last name, man. Antimaceris is his last yeah, name. Yeah, we try to stay away from it. But yeah, Forrest <laughs> Antimaceris. Yeah, it's not not that hard. Yeah, he and I actually are writing a book. Well, we wrote a book. It's coming out this summer. Should be out probably in August. Kind of based on the podcast, but not really. It's called Last Will and Testament, a book by book survey right. of the New Covenant, and that's coming out sometime in August, maybe um, of this year. So we did overviews of every New Testament book, major themes, key verses, things to look out for, and that sort of thing. Okay, that's pretty cool, man. So is that uh is it will it be found on Amazon as well or it'll be on Amazon? It's being done by uh same publications and the light network. Um the lightnetwork.tv will have some information on that. In fact, if you wanted to like pre-order it or sign up to be notified for when the book releases, you just go to the lightnetwork.tv and you can find the information there. But yeah, it should be available on Amazon when it releases too. Okay, that's fantastic then. I know that uh you were one of the co-authors of the book. Um is there in black and white? I know. We studied that book up here in our young adult class, and uh, it was it was great, man. Of course, last summer brought a lot of racial tension, and um, some of that stuff infiltrated the church. And so we wanted to go ahead and address those issues. Um, should have probably been did, uh, uh, address those issues, but we decided to after that book came out. So we, we are appreciative of that as well. So Yeah, I was glad to have a part in it, and I'm glad it was able to do some good. Yes, sir. Well, man, we have uh, we have a, a very interesting topic, and uh, if you if you don't mind clarifying, I think I think we talked about it once before, but you ran track in high school or college? I ran in high school. Yeah, I ran long distance in high school. I ran okay. two mile, mile, that sort of thing. I still run today, not in any competition sort of thing, but yeah, man. I've just always been a runner, so that's how yeah, my, well. that's how I get most of my exercise in. I always say I'm gonna start lifting weights. I don't know if I'm gonna <laughs> stick with that, but I will run because that's pretty low maintenance and easy for me to do. People hate cardio, but it's the favorite part of the workout for me. So goodness, man. You are the first <laughs> guy I ever heard to say that running was low maintenance. <laughs> for me, it is. It's just what I like to do. So well, I I dig it, man. I I'm a workout guy. I love to lift weights. The best cardio for me is uh doing maybe CrossFit or something like that. Mm-hmm. No running. No running, man. I, yeah, I can't do <laughs> running. Uh, I, I may jog a few, you know, uh, times out of a week or something like that. But most of my cardio comes from maybe jump roping or something like that. So mm-hmm. uh, that's how I get most of it in. But, well, man, the the topic that we're looking at is uh, hurdle hurdling the hurdles, uh, which mm-hmm. can't be a tongue twister. But um, against the questions that we're going to talk about and discuss and, and answer are very, very practical in nature, I guess. And most of them came from young adults who are facing and dealing with various struggles in life at the, at the moment. And um, I think a lot of this is going to help, man. And including myself, uh, we talked about that podcast, just listening to the conversation between two people, and it's going to be helpful uh, to get this practical knowledge, man, so we can know and learn how to navigate in our society as Christians. So uh, the first question that I want to, that I want to ask, man, is, uh, you know, when you think about this idea of, you know, facing issues and, Uh, whether or not you should stand up and face or run away from an issue. I know I've always been the type of guy who tried to stay away from confrontation. I just don't like confrontation. And so I do whatever I can to avoid it. Uh, But then there are times that you cannot avoid it. So in my mind, you can avoid it like Joseph did with Potiphar's wife. He decided to run instead of staying there and allowing the situation to, you know, Mm -hmm. become more complex. But then there are times you can't avoid it. 
like Daniel. Uh, he knew the law and Daniel chapter six, he knew the law had been changed and he couldn't pray to God, but he chose to pray anyway. And it's almost like he was choosing to stand up and face uh, the issue. And so my question to you is like, when, how can we decide whether we should run away from an issue or stand up and face an issue head on? Yeah, I think it depends. I think it depends on what you're talking about. Like, for example, with Joseph, Joseph ran. And in the New Testament, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. So we're never told to like stand up in the face of that sort of temptation and test our strength because that's probably a battle we're not going to win. Joseph runs probably out of spiritual strength. Well, it is out of spiritual strength and not weakness, right? He's held up as admirable for running. But then with Daniel, on the other hand, there is just this, he always had prayed. He wasn't going to cave in and give in. So um, certain issues, and like you talked about confrontation, when we deal with certain people and certain things, um, certain issues shouldn't be addressed at a certain time. Maybe you say later on, certain things have to be dealt with right then and there. But some of that's a judgment call. <clears throat> what we shouldn't do, though, is areas where we know we are weak and it's going to cause us to cave in and maybe surrender our spirituality or lead us into some kind of sin. It isn't a time to test our spiritual valor. So if you say I'm a recovering alcoholic, but I'm going to go in there and I'm going to just sit there and drink fruit punches and water because I'm, I'm strong now. I can face this. You're probably setting yourself up for failure. Right. And right. so if you're in somebody's house one on one of the opposite sex and you're sexually tempted and stuff like that, like we should, the Bible teaches to flee fornication, but also when Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to stumble or sin, cut it off, we do need to take preventative measures. But then there are just other times when it's an opportunity for growth or I am standing for righteousness, like with Daniel and stuff like that, where I don't have to flee. Now, you could make, a, again, I think it's a judgment call in certain circumstances. Would it have been sinful for Daniel to choose to pray privately or not spread the windows and all of that? There's no Old Testament command to do any of that. But maybe his conscience would have been violated because the only reason why he would have been changing his practice is because of the, you know, the, the pressure <laughs> and the persecution of the Babylonians. So right, that's right. just some of what you got to think about. I think it's an issue by issue basis. And some of the questions I need to ask myself is, if I stand up to this, will I be likely to fall into sin? Can I handle this? Is this a temptation? Or is this a sort of a stepping stone for growth in my life? And there's a big difference between those two things. If it's temptation, we're not cowardly, we're not wimpy or anything like that. If we choose to run in the direction of safety, but if it's an area for growth and we need to withstand and to hold fast, God's equipped us with everything we need to be able to do that. So we just got to look at those things on a case by case basis. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it, there was a conversation I was having with a with an emerging adult and she was essentially saying, like, you know, I know the verse that says, be still and know that I am the Lord. And, you know, I just feel like patience can be a weakness sometimes like it's almost like if I wait too long I may miss my opportunity to do something great or to um, to marry that man that I've been waiting for for so long if I if I continue to be patient he may pass me by you know and I, I still remain single after all of, you know at the end of the day and after all is said and done and so I guess another question that, I, that comes to mind is you know is it is it ever possible for patience to serve as a disadvantage than an advantage you know, patience never serves as a disadvantage. Um, it's one of the fruits of the spirit, right? And Paul says you can practice those things freely without a law. But what can be a disadvantage is our misunderstanding of what patience is. So if we think patience is inactivity and stillness without moving or doing what we can on the human end, we may be idle to our own fall and detriment. Like that's not going to be helpful, right? The Bible says be patient, be people of long suffering and all of that. And you've never been too patient. There's no such thing, I don't think, of doing too much of what God says, like love. Like, there is nothing wrong with love. There's no such thing as being too loving. So you could misappropriate love and give too much credence to something that you shouldn't. But at that point, it wouldn't be love anymore. It would be whatever your misunderstanding of that is. And so there's no such thing as being too patient. But we can be too passive, though. And we can mm -hmm. be too hands off. And we can call that patience. But the Bible doesn't. So Psalm 4610, be still and know that I'm God does not mean don't do anything in whatever circumstance, looking for a mate, trying to find a job, making decisions about ministry, whatever with your kids. It doesn't mean don't do anything. <laughs> it's more about having a tranquil inner peace. David saying in that Psalm about all the tumultuous things that's happened in the sea and all of this, keep inside and remember that God's really in control. You can be still, you can be unmoved by all those things because God's in control. But 
the Bible still has just a slew of verses about our personal responsibility and what we're supposed to do. And we can do all of that and be patient. Like those two things are antithetical. They're not opposite to each other, right? And so we can't be too patient, but we can be too passive and call it patience. Like, look, you need a job, man. You're going hungry. Well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to drop something in my lap. You can call yep. that patient, but that's not patient, right? You could say, hey, man, I really want to get married or whatever. And I'm just waiting for somebody to bring Mr. and Mrs. Right around. But if you miss every young adult devotional, every youth camp, every seminar where people of similar age are going to be present, that's not being patient. That's being passive and you're doing so to your own detriment. And so patience is biblically defined is about being somebody that suffers long that does everything they can on their end, but trusting God to work everything out. And as they're doing their part and waiting on God to work it out, they never put God on the clock. They always mm. trust that his timing will be perfect. And when it's time, it's going to come to pass, right? And so Israel was waiting for the Messiah. Hey, they're waiting and waiting and waiting. But in the meantime, they still got to live life. They still got to do their part and God's going to show up and we just wait until that happens. And so in our daily lives, on the practical side, do all that we can but trust God's going to do his part. And that's where the patience comes in. And you've never waited on God for too long, right? You don't right. give God a time limit. And then you're like, well, I've waited too long. It's time to take it into my own hands. Um, see King Saul for a bad example of how that works out. And so, right. um, yeah, I think patience is always good, but sometimes I don't understand patience properly. What I think is patience is like, no, you should be doing more on this end. You could be doing a little bit more. You should be using your resources and talents and being more responsible. Right. You know, I think that's uh, that's helpful for me, especially. I have always confused patience uh, to be at least there to be some type of relationship or correlation between patience and inactivity, especially mm -hmm. how people utilize the word when talking about God. Like I would ask someone like, hey, you know, I see you're mentioning that you want to be married and stuff like that. I'm like, well, you know, I, I know a person who's single, you know, something like that. And they say, well, I'm just waiting on God's timing. And I'm thinking, yeah, when the Bible says wait on the Lord, it doesn't mean don't do anything. Literally wait. It's saying, right. hey, you know, be ready for God's involvement, like be OK with whenever God shows up, wait on the Lord, give God time to act. But it doesn't remove any action on my part. Now, it's certainly true that we can act too fast without prayer, without seeking the proper passages and all of that or the people that God's put in our lives. We can run out ahead of God. That's possible. And that would be right. a mistake. But um, like the Bible doesn't teach us to just sit here and wait, because especially in the time period in which we live, there will be no audible communication. So when would you even know that exactly. X, Y, or Z was from God? That's just setting ourselves up for failure to wait for something that's never going to come. There will be no grand lightning bolt moment anyway. And so to wait around for that is just to wait for nothing. And so, yeah, we got to do our part, but patience involves trusting that God will show up and however long that takes, that's all right with me. Like, I want to be married. Okay, I'm going to keep myself in the best condition, keep myself pure. I'm going to meet people. We're just using this as an example. This is the one right. we keep going back to, but I'm going to be an example, do what I can. And when that time comes, whenever it comes, I'll be ready. But I am going to meet people. I'm, I'm going to be outgoing as best I can. I'm going to, quote unquote, put myself out there. I'm going to do the things that I can to put me in position. I want a job. Okay, I'm going to go on the interviews. I'm going to get the training I need, the education. I'm going to do everything on my part. And when the job says yes, then the right, everything aligns, pay, schedule, all of that. Then I know, hey, I believe based on what I know, this is what God wants me to do. But the waiting part is waiting on that yes and waiting for the things to align. But I don't need to wait to get myself straight and do what God wants me to do and what I can control because the Bible calls that slothfulness. And that's a problem. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think the same issue, uh, well, not really an issue, but I think the same principle can be found over in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Uh, when those Christians, they're obviously facing um, immense persecution. Some thought that it would be best to go back to the old religion of their fathers. And mm -hmm. uh, many of them probably did, man. But um, I think about this idea of, of being in a race, a marathon, like you need patience, even though you're still running. Right. And yeah. so it, it, I guess the question that I have now going over to Hebrews 12, one through two, uh, what does that passage teach us about the Christian race itself? Well, it teaches us that it's going to take some effort and some striving for sure, right? Hebrews 12 says we have a great cloud of witnesses and we need to run the race set before us with patience. So I've got to run my race. I've got to do my part and I got to do it with endurance. And that's another thing about biblical patience. It's about enduring. It's about holding out, not being a quitter 
really. And that's what I was talking about, waiting on God to come. It's about not necessarily inactivity and stillness, but in the midst of your activity, patience is don't be a quitter. And you said the context for the book of Hebrews is either leaving the new law, going back to their comfort zone of the old covenant, something of that nature is going on in the book. And so after he lists this slew of people in Hebrews 11 who didn't quit, even though faced with just mountains of adversity, I think Hebrews 12 is about as we live the Christian life, which is styled as a race in Hebrews 12, don't be a quitter. Don't give up. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep looking at the finish line, just like when you're running any distance and you you may get tired at the one mile mark. But hey, a marathon is 26 miles. So you can't quit now. You got to keep looking up ahead. You got to keep pressing on, put one foot in front of the other. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying in that text. Hey, run the race set for you with patience and look at Jesus. You've got an right. example. You can do it. You know, I, I, every time I read Hebrews 12, man, I, I often look at the the cloud of witnesses, you know, like Moses, David, I look at all of those individuals as checkpoints. It's almost like you're running this race. And obviously the ultimate goal of the finish line is Jesus. And you're looking at that, like, you know, what's expected in the end and you know what your goal is, but you're looking at these checkpoints, letting you know that you're on the right path. These individuals have gotten through the difficulties in life and they have continued to strive um, to make sure that they reach the finish line. And I often consider uh, I guess I often consider this idea. Some people are they're they're almost sort of bold and telling you like, man, you know, I got these scars from, you know, uh, waiting or, or, or trying to do what God has asked me to do. And I got these scars from that. And look at me, I'm a super Christian. Like, war I'm, wounds. They got war wounds. Yeah. 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 Like I got I got these, you know, these battle tested scars like, you know, I am a super Christian, you know, it's the can those scars be a testament to them withstanding something that was truly significant as a Christian, or could it be a testament to them doing something stupid? And because of it, they got a scar. Yeah. Lumps on our heads can be because of faithfulness or foolishness. It just depends. Right. So when Paul gets stoned, it's faithfulness. He's preaching the word. But if you run into a place and you say something stupid, sometimes you suffer for your own, your own reasoning. Right. Um, if any man suffer as a Christian, then don't be ashamed. But right before that, Peter says, hey, don't suffer in these areas. Don't suffer for right. being like sometimes we get scars because we've done stupid things or we've done foolish things or we've made bad choices. And we can try to like costume those things as, oh, they did that to me because I was a Christian. No, you did something foolish. You misrepresented Christianity. And so it all depends. The goal of the Christian life, from what I can tell, is not to get scarred up or to avoid getting any scars. It's just to do what God has called us to do. And whatever comes with that comes with it. So everybody that lives the Christian life is going to have some degree of persecution. But I don't think we need to develop a martyr complex where we just believe we always have to be on the run, always embroiled in controversy, always hated by our contemporaries in order to be doing Christianity right. Because if we do that, we will create unnecessary conflict just to feel like we're doing something like right. you can live a good and faithful Christian life and have some levels of adversity without being the Apostle Paul or somebody like that or without being in these sort of third world situations where you feel like, oh, you've got to hide to worship and all of that. And if that comes, any faithful Christian should say, hey, I'm glad to suffer for my Lord. I welcome it. But just because you don't have that doesn't make you you know, insincere or not genuine or whatever. And just because you do have some scars doesn't always mean you've done what was right. Sometimes, again, situations come about because we've made bad choices. And so every, I guess you could say in Christianity or in life in general, scars need to be evaluated. Like, why are you scarred up? Is it right. because you've suffered for righteousness sake and you just did the best you could and trouble found you? Or is it because you ran into foolishness and you said silly things that you shouldn't have? And we saw a lot of that this past year with masks and different, a lot of controversies came up and some people thought they were suffering for righteousness sake, but maybe they were just suffering because they didn't make wise choices and say wise and biblical, sound, biblically sound things. And so it just depends on why we have the scars we have. But when the church started in Acts chapter two, it didn't last for a long time, but right away, Acts 247, they had favor with all the people, mm -hmm. right? Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding day by day. So there was a time when like they weren't under heat and fire. And there are several places in Acts where it says there was peace throughout the churches and everything was going okay. And that's all right. Like that's not times of peace are welcome. We pray and thank God for being able to worship without persecution and stuff like that. And then we sometimes think, We've got to have all these scars to prove right. that we really are bona fide disciples. And I don't see that. I mean, 
I guess if we think like that, we haven't faced any real persecution because most people that have, though they're not ashamed of it, I guess they don't welcome it. It's not fun. And so exactly. we're not masochists. We're not people that just like pain for pain's sake. Just beat me. I just like, <laughs> you know, that's crazy. That's not Christianity. Right. The apostles were let down people in baskets when they could get away from the trouble. Mm -hmm. It was a wise thing. But when they couldn't do anything else to avoid it, it's like, if you want me to stop preaching Christ, if you want me to stop living godly, if you want me to compromise and say X is good when it's really bad. No, I can't do that. But as much as we can, we should try to say, hey, whatever we can do to still live godly and avoid physical lumps and bruises. I'm all for that. Yeah, man. Something I love that you said, you was like some scars are a result of faith and some are a result of foolishness and it, I didn't even give the context to this question exactly but I was talking to a young man and he was just you know telling me how that his father made him feel like a an inferior Christian and it was always because his father would say things like uh you, I have been through so much I done done so much for the Lord and you know I used to do this and that and we faced this and you know, we were out protesting against this as Christians, man, you know, y'all young Christians don't do anything like this today. And, you know, all of that type of stuff. And even when I went and spoke to his father, you know, and told him that I was 24, he was like, oh, he said, you still a young buck and, you know, still wet behind the ears and stuff like that. And I mean, it, it's almost kind of like people are trying to older Christians are, it's like they're belittling, belittling you as a Christian because you haven't experienced everything that they have experienced or you haven't been battle tested and things like that. So they, it's almost like they're saying like, man, your faith isn't as strong as my faith. And so that's, that's kind of the context behind the question. And, and yeah, getting those and battle I would scars. say this, like when you keep reading Hebrews 12, the Hebrew writer eventually says, Hey, you haven't resisted. You haven't striven to flesh and blood resisting sin. So there are levels, like there are people that have suffered more than us, right? You can look at their lives and say, man, they've suffered a lot. And there's a place for that. What we should do with that though, from what I can see in the new Testament is not compare ourselves and say, Oh, I'm wimpy. I haven't suffered as much. It really should serve as motivation to keep going because if they persevere, we can persevere but it shouldn't serve as this barometer of faithfulness that until I reach where they are, I'm not really a faithful Christian. Like people that have all these battle scars and wounds, if they've maintained their faith, I can look at them and say, okay, look at all they've been through. Look at all they suffered. If they can keep going, I can too. But it's not really my responsibility to judge my life based on theirs. All God asks for anybody to do is be faithful in their context and in their generation and be a good steward of their resources and talents. And that looks different to people in different generations in different places and that's all right. And if we start to compare ourselves, like I know I'm, we're faithful because we did this and your generation didn't do this. It may be that God looks at what you did in your generation and he wanted you to do more. You know, you didn't do anything. And it's always easier to compare ourselves to older people or younger people or whatever. And we could say today, well, look, your generation didn't do anything. We got the internet. Now look at how many people we're reaching. You preach to 200 people. This YouTube video has been viewed by 2000 people. We're more faithful than you. Well, no, in the time in which you lived, you use radio and printed page and everything you had, and now more resources have come available and God wants us to steward that rightly. And yeah, we may be battling more atheists and YouTube comments and all of that. It's a different context, different generation. And the goal is not to compete with each other, but to encourage each other to say, hey, what did y'all do right? What are y'all doing right? And let's try to do that and multiply that really and not be against each other. Right. I mean, we're on the same team. That's how I look at it. I mean, it's, exactly. it's no, there's no point of fighting each other. You know, one conversation that I had with um, another, another uh, young, young adult was this idea of feeling like they were caught between a rock and a hard place. And the context of that was as a Christian, you almost feel like you have to live up to, obviously, you know, you have to live up to the, uh, to Christianity, to the laws that we are expected to live by. But sometimes you're all, you're, you're expected to live up to the traditions that are with found within Christianity that are implemented by other Christians who may be older. And then also you're expected to fit in to society. And so it can be hard. And it's almost like, man, what do I do? Your head is spinning. You're out of control. And so here's my question for that. How, how do I focus on the foundation of the Christian race that I'm running without being distracted by the hurdles implemented by the world or even some traditions in the church? The only way I know to do that is to just become really familiar with what the new testament actually says and then we can figure out okay is x really whatever this thing is right is this really a commandment a requirement of jesus christ or is it a requirement of culture or of 
Christian tradition even, which isn't bad, right? A tradition is just something that's been handed down, but we got to watch how we bind them or how far we take them. But what we've got to make sure that we do is not allow to be bound on us or to bind on other people more than what Jesus has said. And so the only way to really do that, and sometimes these things blend together and we get confused on what is traditional and what is really scriptural. And we got to keep those things separate. There's only one way I know to do that. And that is to become familiar enough with the Bible so that you can clearly see, hey, this is a good endeavor. It's a good thing, but it's not a New Testament requirement. And so to not become distracted is, of course, you can't read the Bible 24 seven, but know what the Bible says. And then when these, you know, whatever, these different options come about through culture or through the church, then you can make a decision. It may not be bad or inherently sinful, but you can make a decision on whether you think you have to engage in this or do you want to do this sort, this certain thing or whatever. And, you know, there are different checkpoints to go through as far as whether or not to engage in a, a matter of option, whether it be in the church or tradition that we have or as far as in the culture, whether something that should be done or should not be done. But if it's in the Bible and if God wants me to do it, I've got to do it. If it's in the church and it's a tradition, well, then that's a different question because it would be about, would this violate my conscience? Would this harm my influence among the congregation? What am I losing by doing this? Like, is this something I really want to die over? You know, do I want to die on this hill? Is this something I can compromise on and live with it? Does it matter? And then when it comes to the culture, that's a different one, right? Right. Is this going to affect my influence? Is this going to maybe not be sinful, but come across as sinful and affect me in evangelism? Would this build a bridge to reach somebody else, but it's not inherently, you know, wrong or the New Testament doesn't command me to do it. So there's some different checkpoints, but the way to start is, okay, what does the Bible say? And then where does all this other stuff fit in? I think sometimes we don't start that way, though. We start with tradition and the Bible, like on the mm -hmm. same level, we're trying to wrestle between which one is right. But if we become familiar enough with scripture at the start we can say okay god doesn't tell me i have to do this or god does say i have to do this and that excludes x y and z or all options are off the table the decision is already made so we have to do that and that's easier said than done that sounds like oh just read the bible but it's so much more than that it's reading the bible learning how it applies learning how to handle it properly because a lot of people that bind traditional things they think it's Bible, right? They think right. it's in the text. And so um, it takes some time, I think, to get out of that. And every one of us struggles with it in one way or another because we think our traditions are best. And over time, if we're not careful, we think our traditions are equated with Bible because we've been doing them so long. We just think the two things just go together, but they don't. Right. You know, I remember a story that I was told by my grandma and it, it essentially went something like this, like, there was a mother who cut off half the turkey for Thanksgiving, like over half the meat is gone. And her daughter was like, why, why do you do that? And then she was, like, I don't know. My mom did it. And so they had to go back to her mom. Like, okay, mom, why do we cut half the turkey off uh, for Thanksgiving? She didn't know. She had to go back to her mom and she asked her mom, she said, why do we cut half the turkey off for Thanksgiving? She said, Oh, I didn't have a pot big enough for the turkey to be in. So I had to cut half of it off to fit into the pot. Yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So now it's like, yeah, you're losing half of the turkey because you never understood why the tradition was implemented in the first place. Not that it was ever meant to be a tradition. I mean, it's just passed down, you know. Yeah, you just went along with it. That's right. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's a lot of things that I think about when it comes to, uh, to tradition itself. But I know for me, when when going to this idea of, of being caught between a rock and a hard place as far as a Christian, sometimes, you know, you feel like you have to live up to the expectations of, Christian tradition, and then uh, the culture. Um, is it one of the hardest questions that I was asked was, is it possible for a Christian to run faithfully as a Christian and as an American citizen? Now, at first I thought to myself, okay, are you asking me, is it possible to be a faithful Christian and a faithful American at the same time? Um, I don't know. I mean, one of the hardest questions I've ever been asked. I mean, how, how do you, how, how would you deal with that? Um, I guess it depends. To me, one of those counts and one of those doesn't. Um, I'm not as worried about the one over the other. If I'm a faithful Christian and if the American ideals are right, then I'm going to be a good citizen. But if I'm a faithful Christian and the American ideals are not right, then I may be viewed as a bad American, but I can still be a good Christian. I would imagine Christians in the first century were viewed as bad, bad citizens of the Roman Empire on occasion because they didn't go to the feast days. They didn't offer sacrifices to Caesar. But their goal was not necessarily to be a good Roman citizen or a bad Roman citizen. Their goal was to be a faithful Christian. And as long as they did that, 
in the areas where the Roman Empire was right and they had things in line, the Christians would be the best. Paying their taxes, Romans 13, you get their money up front. They'd be the best guys. But in the areas where there was conflict and where the Roman Empire wanted them to do things that were wrong, there would be some pagan people that would be far better upstanding Roman citizens than them, but that wasn't really their goal. And so for me, my goal isn't to try to be a good American as much as is to be a faithful Christian. Now, of course, I'm going to be a good American citizen in the areas where God says I have to pray for citizens. I mean, pray for rulers, pay my taxes and be a good neighbor. That really about sums up what I owe the country. Um, now, I don't have to be a patriot or anything to do any of that. I just have to be a faithful Christian. And if I do that, and wherever any society, not just America, but there are Christians everywhere, whenever any society or government has laws that are upstanding and right and good, Christians will excel because we are already following a higher law anyway. We're going to excel right. in those areas. But where a country's laws are not right and righteous, we may be very well viewed as bad citizens. So is it possible? Yes, it just depends. It just depends on the state of the country. The Christian part is always right. But whether we're going to be considered faithful American citizens or not, it just depends on what time and place we are in our country and culture, because sometimes I don't want to be. Right. right. Because of certain things that may be going on in the country, I can't be. And that right. just depends, I guess, from year to year and time to time because countries change. But worldly empires are that way. I don't really expect much of them. Babylon's will Babylon. That's just what they do, man. That's what even our favorites like America. That's just what these nations do. But we're still just to be faithful Christians and where it benefits the country. Great. And where it conf conflicts with the country so be it because our kingdom's not of this world. So we should expect there to be on occasion because God instituted government, I think, we should expect there to be some similarities, but we should also expect there to be some conflicts because the kingdoms of men will not perfectly align mm -hmm. with the kingdom of Jesus. If they do, then they're just as good as the church and that couldn't be true. So I expect there to be times when there's tension between my American citizenship and my heavenly citizenship. And that just doesn't surprise me because the Bible says Jesus's kingdom is going to crush every other kingdom. That's going to happen. There's going to be conflict. I hope that that's minimal, but there will be. And I just expect that that's going to be the case. Right, right. I mean, I, I agree. I think uh, tension, conflict, all of that is, is pretty inevitable. It's going to happen eventually. Um, I, I sort of thought while you were answering that question, and it's almost like if you are a faithful Christian, then by default, you're going to be a good citizen, whether you're viewed as a good citizen in the eyes of Well, that's people. only true. If, yeah. yeah, I guess that's only true if people think um, if they equate those two things, you get what I'm saying? Like if you equate being an American citizen with a faithful Christian, but that's not necessarily always the case. Right. I mean, you'll be a good citizen as long as the laws that this country wants you to follow are good. But if the laws that the country wants you to follow are flawed, like in the Roman Empire, for example, you're going to be viewed as a bad citizen. You just will be because you're not you can't do that. You can't offer sacrifices to Caesar. Everybody on your block is doing it. And right. when Caesar's checking off his list about them, he's going to say they're good guys. You're going to be viewed as a bad guy, even though technically as being a Christian, you're the best thing that's happened to this place because of your influence and the gods you serve and all of that. You really are a good person, but you may not be viewed that way. Right. And so, I mean, even with the, the tensions that are inevitable and the tensions that we're going to face, I mean, at times, you know, you can expect to face some fatigue. Am I right? I mean, you can yeah. expect to grow tired. And so I guess a question that I have is uh, how do how do I as a Christian endure the fatigue from constantly jumping the hurdles of the issues of of life? I don't know. Hebrews 12 says looking unto Jesus and just looking at all that Jesus has done for us. Um, there's a lot of things I think we can do. One of them is unplug. There's so much noise in our world, so much 24 hour news. We think we, we've got to know about every controversy and everything that's taking place. And I think some of that just drags us down. We feel like we, I mean, the world's forcing us. You got to have an opinion on every issue and not only right. that, but you got to have one immediately. And so some of that is, um, and that's why you were talking earlier about Hebrews 12 and the way it starts, you know, run the race set before you with patience. Like you've got a race to run your own personal race, focus on what you can control. Don't get so overwhelmed. You can only do so much. You only have so much time, so many resources. Don't become a minimalist. Don't try to do as little as you can, but don't get overwhelmed. Um, unplug from certain things, surround yourself with positive people, obviously pray, 
worship, do those things. Even when you feel like you're not getting anything out of it, you just need to be doing it because God says you do, but it's also healthy for you. And then just appreciate that if you're going to be God's person, there are going to be times of discouragement and fatigue that's happened to the most faithful of the faithful. That's not an indication that you're unfaithful. It's just an indication that you're human. That's what happens to God's right. people, right? John, the Baptist, Elijah, you name them. Any person that's did anything significant for God has those moments where they go through this sort of downward, like, man, am I making a difference? Or how can I juggle all of this? And there's just discouragement because that's part of the human side of things. And we just need to lean on God as best we can in those times and do the same things we've always done, spiritual disciplines, pray, read the Bible, fellowship and all of that. But sometimes I, I feel like you just have to write that stuff out. There's no magic pill to make it disappear. You just got to know it's coming. It's like playing sports and working out, right? Um, we, you're going to have times of cramping. You're going to have times of soreness. What's the magic pill to take to remove all that? Well, there are some best practices you can do. You can stretch and do some things, but then sometimes that's just going to happen. As prepared as you might be, hamstrings going to come up in a game. I mean, you're going to get, but you got to press through. And that's right. just part of engaging in athletic competition and sports and there'll be different things. You can do some things to hurt yourself, drink soda and do all kinds of things to work against you. But even if you did everything right, you're going to have some things that just come up that are a part of it that you got to work through. And that's Christianity. You got to get over those hurdles and, and realizing that everybody has them. And that's where the fellowship comes in, realizing you're not the only one and learning to lean on other people. One, you'll find out your stuff is not as bad as others, but two, even if it is, you're not the only one. I think that's one of the things that weakens us the most. We feel like we're the only ones oh, dealing yeah. with depression or anxiety or loneliness or relationship issues or financial struggles. But when we find out other people are going through it with us, it doesn't remove the issues, but it does soften the blow because we're like, oh, okay, if they if they can handle it, if they're going through it too, then okay. And that doesn't do mean I've done something wrong or something like that. So I think yeah. that helps. Yeah, I think... <laughs> especially when I think about that issue, I always looked at struggle as not sinful just because you struggle with something. I mean, it just mm -hmm. means that you're, I mean, to me, it's almost like growth. Um, when you struggle with something and you continue to battle against the thing that you struggle with, um, it's, I mean, you're literally pushing yourself to your limit, in my opinion, anyway. And I just think that it's almost forcing yourself to grow. And so yeah. I, I, I kind of think of like, I mean, obviously we're looking at it from a track perspective and I know there are certain track stars who hate hurdles. Like they just don't like the idea of hurdles and mm -hmm. they struggle with it. In fact, they have struggled with it their entire career. And I just kind of, I don't know. It, it just makes me wonder about this question. Like, is it possible for me to endure, uh, not really endure, but it, it, as, as far as the obstacles in life, the hurdles in life, um, are they necessary for, for growth? And if so, what, what do those hurdles teach us? Yeah, you're going to have hurdles in life. You can't get around them. They are necessary. They're just a part of the world in which we live. And um, they teach us a lot of things. When you go through hardship, and I don't know what we want to define as a hurdle, like a failing or a shortcoming or just a difficulty of any kind. But just like in track, when you're running and you're jumping over the hurdles, it's helping you to progress and get further down the track. I mean, you could try to knock all the hurdles down, but you won't get down there as fast as somebody else who's right. jumping over the hurdles that's doing it properly. And um the more we go through hurdles in life, we're introduced to who God is. We learn more about him. We learn to trust him more so that maybe the next trial or difficulty, we're more ready to face it. But also um, we learn more about ourselves. Like we may mm -hmm. think we're super strong in the area and the hurdle will show you, man, I thought I've come a long way and I haven't. I'm still stuck back in where I should be gone from now or on the opposite we've been doing a lot of things, a lot of repetition and spiritual things. And we feel like we haven't seen a lot of progress. And then a hurdle comes up in life and you jump over and you're like, man, two years ago, five years ago, that would have crushed me. I would have never been able to get over that. I would have never been able to overcome that. And now I have. And so, I mean, we don't want to pat ourselves on the back prematurely, but we can look at that and say, man, there has been some growth in me. There has been some maturity. Hey, I, I thought, man, if my account got that low, I would crumble, but I've learned to trust God. I made it out and God's been faithful. And you just, you learn yourself in those hurdles. And, you know, the new Testament talks about what patience produces and trials produce certain things. And so we can count them all joy, not because we just are so happy to be going through it, but we know what it can produce in us. And we, we're just wise enough to be alert in those situations and see, right. okay, hurdles are going to come by the way, whether I'm a Christian or not. Christians are just wise enough to try to learn the lessons from the hurdles. Everybody's going to face hurdles. So if you let a hurdle cause you to quit Christianity, 
that's just a bad decision because once you quit Christianity, now you just got the hurdles without the divine aid, right? Because you're going to have them, atheists or agnostic or whatever. So the Christian is different only because he or she, one, has divine aid as we go through the hurdles, but two, we're trying to learn the lesson. Like, what is this hardship teaching me? What is this difficulty teaching me? What is even this failing teaching me about myself, about God? How can I be better going forward? But they're going to be there. And so we just got to try to learn what is God teaching me in this moment and what can I garner to go forward better from here on out? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, in fact, speaking of hurdles, man, I have, I have not heard at least yet of any track star, anyone who uh, participates in tracks and field and track and field say that they have uh, never fallen over a hurdle. In fact, I, everyone I've talked to have said that they, the hurdle has gotten me sometimes. And so oh, yeah, it's going to get you at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I never did a hurdle event, but like in track practice and stuff, I see other guys out there doing it and you might go around there and mess around with it for a little bit. But you know, if you, if you run that event, if you run the race, if you run hurdles, you're going to trip, you're going to stumble. It's going to happen. So it's just a matter of time, but that can't keep you from it. It's just the part of, you know, you play basketball, you're going to shoot an air ball. You will. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. You just will. The Guaranteed. only way to make sure you never do that is to never shoot a shot in your life. Right. So the only way to never trip over a hurdle, you just never run hurdles in your life. You just stay out of it. But then you miss all the blessings and benefits of soaring over them and winning or shooting a basketball and actually making a bunch of shots. And so the only way to be sure that you never stumble in life is just don't do anything. Just stay on the sideline and you'll be safe. You'll be unfulfilled. You'll be, um, unimpactful you'll be unfruitful but you'll stay out of the way but if you do get involved if you do anything great you're gonna make some mistakes and you'll have some hardships and you'll have some hurdles but once you jump over them and you learn from them you'll be better we'll be better for doing it man i love that man that was a great great illustration and explanation of that i know i i remember uh considering that there are track stars who have fallen over the trying to leap over the hurdles they have fallen the hurdles have uh, defeated them sometimes I recall Denzel Washington talking to a young group of theater students and he told them, he said, you know, you're going to fall in life. It's going to be inevitable. He said, but you got to learn how to fall. That was my first time ever hearing that, hearing that. And um, I kind of want to pose it as a question to you. I mean, it, is it possible for us to learn how to fall in life? Yeah, I think as Christians, we know how to fall if we study the Bible well. And by fall, I mean, like how to make mistakes. One is to admit them, right? Like admit mm -hmm. that I make mistakes. If you don't admit that, um, then you, you're you going to make bigger mistakes. Like John says in 1 John 1, in verse 8 and verse 10, if you say you have no sin, then that's a sin. You just compound the problem. So learning to admit our mistakes is part of that. Learning that we won't stay down when we fall. Like we will make mistakes, we will trip up, but learning how to fall means I intend for this to be temporary. I intend for this lapse to be not where I stay. This is just a temporary block. I made a mistake today, I'm gonna try to go forward. And so admitting mistakes is part of that. Um, resolving to not stay down, learning so that I don't continue to fall in the same way. So if you're running hurdles in track, for example, and like every time you come out of the blocks, you keep tripping over the first hurdle, the first hurdle you want to eventually count your steps or do whatever you got to do. Now you may trip again on like the fifth one, but at some point you want to conquer that first one. Cause we got to make some progress. You can't, you can't go forward, just continuing to miss that first hurdle. So you got to go forward. And that's what we've got to do is we fall like, okay, the devil got me here. I want to learn about this. I want to become wise and sensitive to this area of weakness or whatever, so that I can go forward in the right way and in a good way, because I will sin, but I don't want to commit the same sin every day, the same place, the same time. And so learning from those falls, maybe not learning how to fall all the time, but learning from them so that I can be better regrouped and stuff like that. And not just having the defeat mentality about, Hey, I failed. So this must mean this is where I belong. I'm doomed. I'm done. This trial has done me in, but no saying I'm going to get up and go forward from there. Man. I, I love that. I, I actually thought, um, had a thought while you were saying that it's almost like if I did participate in track and field and I had a close race, whether the, you know, my opponents were facing that I was facing was, you know, uh, specific sins, you know, I would rather fall to me, a proper fall would be to fall forward. Like you're falling across the finish line to break that plane and, yeah. you know, ultimately to, uh, uh, to finish the course. Right. And so it's almost like if if I had to crawl into heaven, man, that's that's just what I have to do. Uh, I'm willing to do that because <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be left on the outside, you know. 
Um, and so a, a, as we come to a close, man, I just, and I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, this idea of, uh, of patients not being uh, uh, in activity. And so what do you think about this idea of, is it possible to have an attitude of contentment and progress at the same time? Because there are just some people who don't believe that when they are content with what, you know, with a certain job or something like that, then to them in their mind, it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just supposed to be okay with staying at, staying at this, you know, entry level position for the next five, 10 years, you know, when I can be uh, running the company, um, if I was to be a little bit more ambitious and stuff like that. So, I mean, is it, what do you think about that? Is it possible to have an attitude of contentment and progress at the same time? It's not only possible, it's a necessity. You have to. Um, if you're going to be God's person, you have to. And that means different things in different contexts. But the same book of Philippians where Paul says he's striving for the prize of the high calling is the same book where he says he's learned to be content in everything about his material needs, at least in chapter four. So like if you if you had one of those without the other, if you had contentment with no desire to progress, you could eventually just become so, you know, just so content with your circumstances, you could become so satisfied where you are that you don't develop and become all that God wants you to be. But if you've got this yearning and this desire for progress without any contentment, you could be dissatisfied and never enjoy the blessings along the way as you've eventually reached the goal that you want. But like the example you used about a person at a job on an entry level position, they may have the potential to be a CEO or whatever, but they may not want to. Um, I'm not even, I don't think they have to, but they do need to try to be the best that they can be in that entry level. Or maybe progress for them means training other people that will eventually climb the rank. So they may have some reason for not doing whatever. And so um, yeah, we do need to be people that progress and try to develop our talents and gifts and abilities for God and in every area of our lives, while also being content with what we have and where we are in the current moment, because God's working on us. And that's a process. And that's still taking place on a daily basis. And so to forget that is to become discontent with God and frustrated with him. Like, no, I want to be here tomorrow. And if I'm not here, nothing's going to be good enough for me until I can get here. Well, that's going to be a pitiful way to live and not real God honoring. But at the same time, if we just get to where we are and we're like, I'm happy here and God wants to move us and help us to develop more and to learn more and to grow more and to use more of our gifts, talents and treasures and abilities. And we just are content with where we are. Well, that's not God honoring either because, hey, man, God's got more for you to do. So there has to be that balance of both of those things. Mm -hmm. And it just comes with that idea that God has worked on me and God is working on me right? God has worked on me. That's the contentment part, man. God's brought me a long way. I mean, that's not an illustration. That's true. God right. brought me a long way. God's worked on me, but God is working on me. He's still doing stuff and working in me. And so I can be looking forward to the future and I need to continue to be developing in the process. Man, that, that was phenomenal, man. I, you know, I got to quote you on that. I mean, seriously, like God has worked on me and God is working on me. That's true for me too. <laughs> yeah. I definitely appreciate it, man. If we, if we got that mindset, you know, that's, that'll help us. Absolutely. Well, Hey, Hiram, I, I definitely appreciate the conversation, man. And uh, before we go, I just wanted to ask you, is, is there anything, um, any, I don't know, practical um, advice or anything that you would like to leave uh, this, this uh, young generation with uh, before we go? Um, I appreciate you having me on. I think we pretty much said everything that I would say. I would just say um, to the generation that we're in and younger to, realize you can do a lot now and you don't have to postpone it until you get into your career, or until you get the college degree, or until you get married. Like, don't wait for ideal circumstances to do what you can and should be doing right now. You can accomplish a lot right now. Because if you wait till your 30s, you'll look back and say, oh, what I could have done in my 20s. If you wait to the 20s, you'll look back and say, oh, what could I have done in my teens? Or if you wait to the 40s. So do what you can now and be looking forward to all the more that you'll do in the future because the truth is we will probably do in the future something similar to what we're doing right now so if we believe that when we get to this perfect job or get this degree or we're making this much money we're going to transform into these super workers we probably are deceiving ourselves right and so we should do something now with what we have and god will honor that and then we'll maybe promote it and bless it more Hey, man. Well, I need to hear that myself. So, hey, Hiram, thank you, man. Thank you so much for being on the on the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Hey, appreciate it, man. Keep it, keep up the good work.